Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Method Ministries. Today we're going to be joined with Pastor Samuel. I don't want to butcher his last name because he, he literally just told me and, and I just <laughs> forgot. But he is, he, he came out of the Coptic Orthodoxy. So he left uh, Orthodoxy and he knows all about it. So, he, so we're going to talk about it here as testimony. And I think this is a really interesting conversation because as we were talking about before we started recording, a lot of people, you, you can find out on, on YouTube where people have left Protestantism and they're going towards Eastern Orthodoxy and they're coming home as, as they like love to tell us. And so, you know, I, I found him the, I think it was last week and I wanted him to discuss because now we, we you know, we can also see, hey, there are also people who are coming out of the Orthodox religion and into Protestantism and you know, Pastor Samuel will tell us that, you know, uh, his journey was through salvation, but I'll let you introduce yourself and talk about that. So yeah, thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's, it's a pleasure to just, uh, just share, share the background that I have and if it can be helpful to other people, um, and really just, um, God's mercy. I mean, God's grace in the whole entire situation, his providence and his, um, leading me out of the Orthodox church. So yeah, I spent most of my life in the Orthodox Church. I, I would be considered a cradle. I was born into the Orthodox Church. I was part of the Coptic Orthodox Church and was a part of it for 32 years. And uh, so that's, that's most of my life in there. And uh, my family was very much ingrained into the church um, from the very beginning before I was even born. Um, my parents actually had um, a difficult time having children. In fact, mm. uh, the doctors told my mother, it's impossible for you to have mm. children. So they had reached out to all different types of um, monasteries and different people and were praying um, for, for a miracle to happen. So it was actually a monk who responded and said, okay, you're going to have these children and you're going to name them, here are the names that you're going to have for them. Um, and, and that's when my, my parents actually um, had me. So so actually I am, my, me and wow. my brother are actually named by a monk. Um, oh, yeah, so it was, it was very interesting, and um, from an early age, like I was still an infant, and um, the the priest who baptized me actually called up uh, my mom and said, "Okay, um, go to him and kiss his hand." And my mom was like, "Excuse me, what?" Because no, go and kiss his hand. And then it clicked for her because in the Orthodox Church, they believe in true presence in the Eucharist. So usually, when a priest handles the because the priest handles the communion elements. Uh, people often go and kiss his hand. Mm. So when um, the priest said that, she realized, oh, it must mean that when my son grows up, he's going to be a priest. So I grew up with a lot of that too. And of course, I didn't want anything to do with it growing up, um, being a priest or anything. Um, but um, nonetheless, I was still very much involved within the church throughout um, my, my whole life growing up in it. I had developed what's called an Orthodox Feronima, which is an Orthodox worldview. You just saw everything through an Orthodox lens. Okay. Um, There's a book called Orthodox Thinking, um, and it makes a distinction. Although I was part of the Oriental Orthodox Church, that Orthodox thinking, that Orthodox Feronima is shared between even the Eastern Orthodox and the Oriental Orthodox. There's examples even in that book of a Coptic Orthodox person who had an Orthodox Feronima. That's mentioned. Oh, oh so um, Coptic and Oriental, those are uh, synonyms for the same? Yeah, so the Coptic church is part of the Oriental church. So there's different churches within the Oriental, um, and Coptic's one of them that's in there. Okay, because it, it does get confusing for me, and this is the interesting part too, is there, they'll criticize Protestants and say, you guys have so many denominations. Yeah. You look at their history, wait a minute, guys, you were doing this way before us. Yeah. In the fourth century is where the Coptic Orthodoxy came from. And then again, you know, you have also, in addition to this, you have different flavors of Eastern Orthodoxy, you have Roman, I'm sorry, you have Russian Orthodoxy, Ukrainian Orthodoxy. And again, you know, schisms like this have taken place long before Protestantism came in, into being um, at all. W uh, would you be able to give, you know, the viewers a nutshell, the difference between Coptic Orthodoxy, Oriental Orthodoxy, between Eastern Orthodoxy? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the Coptic Church is part of the Oriental Orthodox Church. And yeah, they're not in communion at all with the Eastern Orthodox Church. So the way that the Oriental Orthodox Churches see themselves is that they are the true church. They, are, they Only through them is the Ark of Salvation. If you're not in them, you are in the floodwaters, you are under God's wrath. The Eastern mm -hmm. Orthodox think the exact same thing. Um, you have to be part of their church. Part of They are the Ark of Salvation. If you're not part of them, you're in, the, um, you're in the God's wrath in the waters. Um, so both churches um, are not associated with each other because they have had um, the difference at the, the, the fourth council in uh, 451 in the Council of Chalcedon. There was a disagreement there on how to discuss the natures of Christ. 
Um, so the Orientals believed that Christ had two natures, but insisted that those two natures are inseparable and united. So the way that they would describe it, the Oriental Orthodox Church, is that they believe that Christ, that Jesus is of two natures, which is Maya theism, and the Eastern Orthodox would describe it that Jesus is in two natures, which is diotheism. Mm. Um, but if you look at most theologians today, when they talk about it, they realize that really they were both trying to say the same thing. There, there are some slight differences, but they were they, they were both trying to say uh, the same thing. Now there are certain people on 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 there who have very strong opinions, but like, no, absolutely not. This is complete heresy. What they're saying. Um, and this will even get into the differences of Jesus' wills. Does Jesus have one will or does he have two wills? Um, and you'll find that the Eastern Orthodox and the Oriental um, Orthodox are on different sides. The Oriental will say Jesus had one will, and the Eastern Orthodox will say, no, Jesus had two wills. He had a divine will and a human will. Huh. Um, so it's those differences that they have, but when the actual practices of the church, and, and the thing is, um, it wasn't that I wasn't even exposed to Eastern Orthodoxy while I was in the Oriental. We had a, a family friend's, who are part of the Eastern Orthodox Church, and we would attend service with them all the time, and it was basically like the same thing. There were okay. some little differences, um, but it was practically the same thing um, in, in a lot of the practices. Um, and my brother, um, who grew up with me in the Oriental Church, he actually officially converted into the Eastern Orthodox Church. Really? So I visited church with him, and we've discussed extensively the big differences in it. Um, and the biggest difference um, is, is that difference in the natures and also of the how many councils that they um associated as, as ecumenical. Oriental believe in three, whereas the Eastern Orthodox believe in seven ecumenical councils. So okay. those are the, the, the differences, but if you actually speak to most people within the church, most of the time they couldn't even tell you the differences. Okay, interesting. Uh, is, is there any talks of them trying to reconcile at there all? Been, there have been many heard. talks. There's been even certain agreements written up. Um, there's even been certain churches that would um, allow communion in certain, uh, like, you can have communion between the two different churches or even marriages between the two churches, but then you'll have others who write these different letters and say, there's no way we can ever commune together. And the big thing about that is once they've um, anathematized each other, or they say that you've, you, you know, they say certain, uh, certain saints for them are considered heretics or something. Once the church speaks in official capacity, um, and we're not just talking about some priest said something or some, even some early uh, father said yeah. something, but when they speak in an official capacity, they, they both believe that the church cannot err. So in order for them to unite, one side has to admit we made a mistake, which therefore means that they weren't really the true church, and now they're coming into the church. So they really, in their um, theology of the church, there's no way for them to truly unite. Yeah, so you have two churches. Both of them are saying salvation is only in us. Yeah. We're also infallible, and yeah. we declare you guys... An uh anathema and like you said they're both locked into this because the these claims are the same yeah and and really you know this helps you to, t to take a look at how arbitrary this is because even the roman catholics historically have said the same thing as well and there's other you know a couple of other ones mixed in there too yeah. all all giving us you know the same exact kind of claims and it's just it really is just baseless and it shows us too that these problems are not unique to protestantism everybody has these schisms going on like you know, recently I'm, I'm I'm even thinking of First you know Corinthians where you look at that early church and all the issues that that, that they had. You know, you know people were saying I'm of Apollos, I'm of this person yes. and that person. Like this has been going on since the first century. It has, and, and here's the key: like uh, you, you have a Wesleyan background, I have a, I'm a Reformed Baptist, but we consider each other each other brothers in Christ. Yeah. In the, in Orthodoxy, when you walk into a church, although they claim to be all united. Um, and, and on the outside, they would be. When you actually speak to the individuals in the church, they have varying different degrees of what they believe theologically. Mm -hmm. um, you, you'll have um, different political beliefs, and, and you don't see the unity there that they claim to have. So a lot of these people are converting into these churches thinking they're walking into something where there's unity. But when you start actually talking to people, you realize they're not as united, um, especially people who are born into the church. They, they oftentimes just, um, they're, they're just in it because they were born into it. Um, so you see a, a wide variety of beliefs. So you actually see more un unity um, in Lutherans, Anglicans, um, Baptists, um, Wesleyans who are united in the foundations of the gospel message, although they may have some different distinctions. And that's where the unity is, is, is key in scripture, that we're united in the core elements, um, not, but not this false unity by just outside appearance. Yes. Amen. So uh, when did you come out of the, uh, I, um, you remain Coptic, you said? Correct. 
Gotcha. Okay, but your brother went East, uh, Eastern Orthodox. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And when did you come out of the Coptic Church? So it was it was a huge journey for me. It was um, I started reading a little bit of scripture and started realizing that there are things that are said in scripture that um, just seem to contradict what what um, the church is actually teaching. So not not looking at what people were doing because obviously people can do um, things that are contrary to scripture. But the church itself, like for example, why are we um, praying to the saints? Why are we asking for their prayers? It, it doesn't show anywhere in scripture that you, we should be doing this. And the way it's presented is, okay, it's the it's the fullness of the faith. This is the exact same faith that the apostles had. And this is a big distinction between orthodoxy and Catholicism. Catholics believe in doctrinal development. So they can take an idea like um, the, the incarnation and say, well, from that, it developed over time into icons. Hmm. Whereas Eastern Orthodoxy will say, no, the apostles... They, they were venerating icons in the exact same fashion that they're venerating icons now. So they actually had the icons out there. In fact, they'll say uh, Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke, he made one of the first icons of Mary. Um, and they'll even have an icon of him making that icon. Hmm. Um, so they actually believe that um, you know, everything that they practice now has always been the case. But simply by studying what Scripture says and looking at church history, you realize, that, well, that's not true. You know, um, monasticism came about much later on. And a lot of these other practices that they claim have been apostolic traditions, really you look at history and they came about later on. So those were the things that I started to to question. So I was church hopping for, for many years, um, just asking God for direction, asking him for truth. And I was asking him for truth, but I, I wasn't ready to really surrender to him. Um, but once we had our, our second daughter, I got married to my wife, who also grew up in the Orthodox Church and also had questions. Um, she was also in the Coptic Church. Um, but once we had our second daughter, we we're like, okay, we need to raise them right and, and give them, uh, raise them in a, in a certain faith. Um, so we had this. We we, we heard a lot about um, Texas and how they always stood up for 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 uh, their rights and everything. And it just seemed oh, okay. a good place to you know raise a family. And we had no family or friends there, so we said, you know what? I was saying to God, look. If we go down there and you can find me a church that's teaching the truth, I'll, I'll move the whole family down there. I was like, I just want to, mm. I just want to find a place that's teaching the truth. And we went down there and we, um, we visited during the Easter season, um, enjoyed the people there. But we walked into a church and we heard the gospel, and that was really the first time that we really heard the gospel. So this is something different. Now, this is a Protestant um, church. Yeah, it was a Protestant church. It was um, uh, probably Assemblies of God um, okay. background. So although I disagree with their, their secondary doctrines, they were teaching the gospel. And when I heard that, I was like, okay, we need to move our family here. Um, and it was it was a bit of a process, but in a few months, we moved our family to Texas. And then three months after that, I, I was saved. And about a year after that, my wife was saved. Wow. Um, and that's when I, that's when the Lord yeah, he just opened my eyes, surrendered to him, and realized that for, for my whole entire life, I've been calling myself a Christian, um, saying that I believe these things, but I was a liar, you know, because I was living for myself. And I was just trying to do this checklist of, of what, you know, the, the Orthodox Church basically said you had to do because – in the Orthodox Church, you really have to work out your salvation. And they do even use, in some of their infallible documents, they even use the the, the words merit. You have to merit it. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, you just you get exhausted from that. The way it's described in Eastern Orthodoxy, it's, it's there's this ladder of ascent that you're consistently climbing. You have no way to know where you're at on it, but there's there's demons and the devil kind of constantly trying to pull you off it. So you just have to continue doing more works, um, continue doing more sacraments in order to climb up that ladder of ascent. Um, and it becomes exhausting because I, I used to do all the different prayers you were supposed to do, the different fasting, um, sleep on the floor to try to like, like, um, you know, hurt my body um, because that was oh, to, wow. you know, supposed to make me yeah. more holy. Uh, just go through all the motions and you eventually become exhausted from doing that. And, and you have no assurance whatsoever. Um, my wife used to um, consistently live and be like, well, I, you know, if I die tonight, I'm going to go to hell probably, you oh. know? And it was just, it was very depressing. That's it was, sad. It was, yeah. It was very sad. Wait, and then when you had conversations with the priest or did you have conversations with the priest about this? Like, Hey, uh, I'm, I'm concerned about, you know, my soul or, or I don't know where I'm at. Oh yeah. All the time. And they would just simply say, well, just keep going to the liturgy and keep, keep, you know, keep going to confession, make sure you keep going to confession. But the problem with confession is you would go and you would confess. And by the time you walk out, you've already sinned. And you're like, okay, what do I do now? You know, I, oh, I just confessed right now. And you can understand yeah. why Martin Luther had the struggle that he had, that he was That's constantly in confession, you know, for hours upon hours and driving everybody crazy of how much he would go there because he realized how, you know, how powerful and destructive sin is. 
but then you lose hope. What am I supposed to do? Because I have to keep coming to this priest who it's through him that I get this, this forgiveness because I get to go through him for confession. Mm. Um, so they would just advise us by continuing to do more works and more works. And, um, you know, they didn't necessarily say don't read the Bible, although there are um, Eastern Orthodox texts that actually frown upon people uh, reading the Bible. But um, the priests that when we were growing up, they didn't necessarily say don't read the Bible, but they um, practiced allegorical interpretation. So when they would take the story of um, the prodigal son, they would say, oh, well, that's actually a story about the liturgy. And you're like, well, there's no way from the text I could ever get that on my own. So in a, yeah. in a sense, what's the point of me studying scripture? I'll just go to the priest. You know, I'll ask the priest, I'll ask a bishop. If, if, if the patriarch's in town, let me, let me ask him a question because he'll have wisdom. So everything was always about going to the priest, going to your, you know, who's your parish priest, going to him and asking the questions because – Sure, you could study scripture on your own, but there's no way you could really know what what it really says because they practice mm -hmm. allegorical interpretation. And then, how long were you you know, feeling like this for? Like, was it a couple of years of your whole life? Uh, no, not my whole life. Probably in, um, I would I would say for several years. Probably um, uh, in probably 2010, 2012, okay. about is when I, when I started questioning it, and um, eventually got saved in twenty seventeen. So, yeah, so it sounded like, you know, when you went to these priests and, and told them, you know, your concerns and questions, nobody gave you the gospel, right? Like, is that what I'm hearing? Oh, yeah. I, I, I never heard the gospel. I, I, I never truly understood because for, for them, uh, when Jesus died, they believe in more of the victory model that, that Christ won a victory. So okay. now, you, now you can be saved because that's how they say, yeah, it is through Jesus. But you have to do all these works and you have to participate in all these sacraments in order to uh, really... Um, um, reach salvation and you'll never know whether you reach it or not. You know, we'll see what happens, you know, when God judges you. So, um, yeah, I never, never understood truly that, that Christ died for me. He paid for my sins. The father crushed the son, you know, they, they, they um, they're very much against penal substitutionary atonement. Um, they, they, um, they believe, uh, no, uh, God just forgives because he can. Um, and he doesn't need, he didn't actually have to crush his son for that. Um, so they believe in simply just a victory model of the atonement, um, but not necessarily penal substitutionary atonement. Is 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 that the same for the Eastern or, uh, Orthodox as well? Like this, it's it, it's kind of like a moral victory. Yes, correct. Okay. Yeah, both of them have that, that same the same theology, and that's the thing too. When you're really looking at the Oriental Orthodox Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church, their theology is is almost identical. There are some some things that are within the Eastern Orthodox Church that you're not going to find within the Oriental uh, toll houses, which is not a, not a mandatory um, doctrine. Some Eastern Orthodox, even people in Eastern Orthodoxy, some believe and some don't. But um, Oriental does not, uh, to my knowledge, does not believe in anything like the toll houses. Okay. Um, but they also have problematic um, beliefs, and 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 it's very similar. Like for example, even with their their belief in icons, they believe the Holy Spirit goes in the icon. Um, when you actually read their their prayers that they do whenever they put up an icon in one of their buildings, they talk about the Holy Spirit going in the icon, and through it you'll have salvation. It's just very very problematic. Yeah. Um, their views. What what were these works that they would prescribe to you? In addition, you know, because their position is it's faith plus works. Correct. And usually when I ask them, what are those works? I get ambiguous answers and you don't get clear cut answers. Was it just like go to church, sacraments? Yeah. Uh, like uh, in, in, the, in the Oriental church, they had um, what we had was a book called the Negebeya, um, at least in the, in, the, in the Arabic or the Coptic. Um, and it was just a, a prayer book. So you were, you were advised to read that. You read them at different hours. Um, you were advised, you had to attend church, make sure you had communion, make sure you participated in um, confession regularly. In the Eastern Orthodox Church, a big thing is um, the Jesus prayer. Um, and you're just consistently uh, going over and over again, saying saying this phrase over and over and over again, um, and, and believing that by just meditating um, on, on certain words and just continue praying and praying and praying, um, you'll, you'll, it'll help you on your ascent on the, on the, uh, ladder of ascent it's lord jesus christ son of god have mercy on me a sinner mm -hmm. so again the words are fine um and you'll hear certain orthodox apologists say oh no the words mean this no we know that the words are fine but what they do is they just repeat it over and over and over and over again and i've even heard it described that um you become you become prayer itself the way you, you keep reading it over and over and over again really okay what, uh, what's the word for that Oh, so there, there's, there's a process called theosis okay. um, within the Orthodox Church. So th this helps you along in your process of theosis. So it, 
in this process of theosis, there's like three different stages that you have. So the first stage is the purification stage. And this involves repentance, um, ascetic practices, prayer, and partaking in the sacraments. Okay, uh, gotcha. And then when you take it to the, the next level, they have something called uh, illumination. And that's when the soul um, begins to see things in their true light. It begins to have, you begin to have a deeper understanding of scripture. Again, having that allegorical interpretation of what scripture says. Um, and then you reach the point of, they call it divination or theosis. And that includes becoming sinless, um, being filled with the divine light, um, taking, uh, God, taking some of God's attributes, um, becoming partakers in the divine nature. Um, and it's with union, but without fusion. And, and that's why, that's why you see on icons, when you see the halo on a saint, that's to show that they've reached a status of uh, a d divination or theosis. Okay. Okay. Wow. Interesting. What, uh, when you left the, or the Coptic church, or, or did you formally leave, or did you just not go? anymore no i just I, I didn't i just uh i guess by me leaving was when i was um when, when i um officially joined another church or, or been or was was baptized or was born again okay that's when i would would officially leave and by leaving um that makes me officially a heretic uh, yeah yeah uh, so that was my question like did they pronounce anything on you did they get mad yeah their their, their belief is that if you've been in the church and then you've left it you're, you're considered officially a heretic so um even oh. when i started um you know preaching and everything um there would be like these these orthodox groups that would grab my website and and post it on there and be like, oh, so what do we do about these these heretics who left the church? And I only knew about it because my brother was part of those groups and be like, hey, they're talking about you. Oh. And I was like, that's fine, let them let them hear the gospel. And in fact, what the priest told him to do is they said, take down his website. We don't want people to go on there. Wow, I mean, I, they, they, they don't they didn't uh, necessarily engage in um, so much of uh, what, what are other people teaching um because they're, they're afraid that people will just leave it as opposed to you know okay yeah. here's, here's, what, here's what others are saying uh, let's go into the historical problems that you also found because this is a heavy argument that they use to trap people and get them converting by saying hey we are the faith of the apostles handed down and it's pure we all agree on it it's infallible so what what were those problems that you saw in history because you mentioned that you read the Bible, you saw problems there. It's not in the scriptures. And it yeah. sounds like, too, you know, you're also saying it wasn't in history. Yeah, you, you look, for example, one of the things that first caught my notice was, why are we praying to the saints? You know, there, there's nowhere in scripture that indicates to us that that's advisable for us to do. I mean, you look at when the disciples were asking Jesus how to pray, he gave them a template. And nowhere there did he say to ask for the intercession of saints. Um, and then when you start looking at some of the other practices, one of the biggest ones, especially in the Eastern Orthodox Church, is um, the Seventh Ecumenical Council, where they make the practice of icons a mandatory practice. Um, they actually anathematize those. If you don't bow down and kiss and venerate the icons, you're under anathema by God, cursed by God to hell. Um, but there's nowhere in Scripture that says that. And historically, that doesn't work at all, because when you actually look historically, um, most of the earliest fathers spoke against any type of um, uh, veneration of images. Um, and really, when you look at the apologetics that Orthodox people use now to defend the use of icons, it's the same thing that um, pagans would use to defend idol worship. You know, the way it would work is that you had an idol. Um, so say you had an idol of Zeus. You didn't actually think that Zeus was the actual idol. You thought that this idol was a window to Zeus up in Olympus. Yeah. Um, and I that's the same that. way that icons are viewed. That here, th that this this painting is not necessarily the saint itself, but it's a window that if you talk to and communicate with it, it's as if it's going to the original saint who's up in heaven. So they use the exact same practices that the church was speaking against. Um, so you look historically and you realize his historically there's no evidence of image veneration. Now there were images, that, that, that is true that there were images, but they were never used in a cultic practice. They weren't venerated um, until much, much later on in the sixth, seventh century. Um, and, and, and now they make it a mandatory practice. And we know that by them making it a mandatory practice, um, they go against the teachings that we find in Galatians, that if you add anything to Scripture and make it a requirement, you then make the, 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 the gospel message void. So what we know is that they're not teaching the gospel at all, and that's why they're, they're truly an apostate church. Yeah, yeah, because they, you know, uh, just to clarify, you know, uh, for the audience, when, when he, you know, Ambassador Sam points out how this is mandatory, they're saying this is a condition of salvation, correct? 
Correct. Because yeah. in their councils, they consider their councils infallible, which means it has the same exact authority as the word of God. And in the Seventh Ecumenical Council, they pronounced anathemas for those who are not venerating icons. So you have to, it's a mandatory practice, participate in the veneration of icons. And the dangerous part is if you walk into an Orthodox church and simply speak to the priest, they either may or may not tell you that. You actually have to really study their doctrines and really see that their ecumenical councils are considered infallible and their anathemas are considered infallible. And and I think people don't realize that nowadays too, because recently there is more of a newer language being used where they want to kind of downplay some things and be more inclusive. Yeah. But as you mentioned, if they're infallible, then this is a really, really hard, hard thing to, uh, to not miss is they're saying you're either in or you're out based upon this. And that includes venerating kissing icons. Yeah. And look, there's no way around this, you know, it's, it's just like a fact of history. And to argue it is a historical, but yet they try to, 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 to go down that route and say, oh, well, it doesn't really mean that. No, it does mean that. Just read like second night, you know, the Council of Nicaea or, or exactly. the 7th Council. Yeah, and and, and and you'll see that, yeah, it, it's, it's a more common trend that people will try to soften what an anathema means to try to keep the church not yeah. sounding that it's so, um, so, so hard on this area that they have a hard time uh, even explaining historically. Like a lot of modern um, Orthodox apologists, what I've seen them do, this new trend that they're doing is they'll look at like um, signet rings um, and, and cups that are used and to have images and be like, look, since they're, they're honored, that shows evidence of um, icon veneration. But what they're really doing is they're extending the word veneration and the objects that are being venerated in order to try to make the claim of icon veneration seem uh, um, apostolic. Yeah. But really, a any theologian, well, even if they're 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 atheists or agnostic, there's no proof whatsoever for this at all. And the best of the best Orthodox apologists struggle tremendously. In this area but when you look at what the orthodox church says about anathema so uh john maximotive is one of their saints and he gave a very clear definition of an anathema and you can look up his quote but some of the key things that he says of an anathema is an anathema means complete separation from the church and again keep in mind that for them you can't be saved unless you're in the church uh, it says those given over to anathema were thus completely torn away from her until their repentance realizing that she, the Eastern Orthodox Church, is unable to do anything for their salvation in view of their of their stubbornness and hardness of heart. So again, you, only the church can you get salvation through it. And if you're under anathema, you can't get out of that anathema unless you repent and join the church. They call people who are under anathema stubborn enemies of God. And they say that if they do not repent, they will stand before the presence of God in a state of hardened evil. So when they wow. say anathema, that's what they mean, and that's yeah. what they mean by uh, that, that their own saints say that's what anathema means. In, in contemporary language, is telling somebody go to hell. Yes, like yeah. you, you know, like we we miss this. Like even when you know you read Galatians, Paul's saying if you preach another gospel, he's saying go to hell. Yeah, like he's saying it's really hard language. It is, and, and it's not saying because they'll sometimes say, "Oh, we're, we're not determining that that person is going to go to hell." We're yeah. just saying that if you don't repent, then you are going to go to hell. That's what yeah. it means. You're cursed by God to hell unless you repent. Um, but for them, repentance is not like, okay, no, I repent of what I'm doing wrong. No, I have to join the Orthodox Church in order to be saved. That, that's what it means to repent for them is to join the church. Out of curiosity, say, okay, so if when you left the Coptic Church, they said you're an apostate, yeah. would you then be able to go into the Eastern Orthodox Church and, and then they would say you're finally saved and welcome you? Or would yeah, they say because you left the Coptic Church, you're still an apostate? No, they, they, they don't acknowledge the, the Coptic Church having any authority whatsoever. Okay. So, um, and even like, for example, uh, my brother, when he went into the church, um, I believe he had to be re because I was just for ask them, that. Okay. Yeah, for them, they believe uh, you receive the Holy Spirit at the point of chrismation when they're putting the oil on you. Um, and honestly, he couldn't even really get a, a clear answer from the priest because, you know, did he have the Holy Spirit before or not? They're like, well, just to be sure. You know, because because for them, even in their, their their teachings, everything has to be done by an Eastern Orthodox uh, priest or bishop. So the fact that he's part of a church that was outside of that, um, they, they couldn't acknowledge that. So they repeated the chrismation process. This is really interesting because I've heard Jay Dyer. Uh, do you know who Jay Dyer is? Oh, I'm very familiar of Jay Dyer. Yeah. So, so this is very interesting because what he'll, what he'll critique Protestants on, he'll, uh, he'll say that because there's no normative authority, you can start 
a scandal, say, at one church, be under church discipline, reject that, and then go over to the next church. Well, you can also do this in, in the Coptic church. You can yeah. jump ship. It starts yeah. over. You get rebaptized pretty, yeah. pretty much. Maybe that doesn't work out. You go to Roman Catholics. Exactly. It, and, and not just that, but the problem. when you go through the, um, the catechism process, some yeah. churches take longer than others. All you have to do is go to another church. You could even be in a Greek church and go to another Greek church. And they and you have a priest who gives, say, a more lenient process. You can go there and, and become chrismated even faster. And wow. I've seen that process before where people were having a hard time. It was going to take too long. So they literally just went to another church and got, got into the church easier. So it, it, it's, it, it's based off the priest. Yeah, they'll say it's based off the parish priest. They make the judgment on how long that catechism process lasts. Interesting. Well, uh, uh, when you became a Christian for the first time, uh, what was that transition like for you? Like going oh. from, you know, kind of like a Martin Luther, it's it it, kind of like... It was completely like earth shattering. It was it yeah. was first realizing th that I had to surrender to him, um, and and when I did that, I mean every all my priorities just completely changed. It was just like I was I was uh, I have a marketing graphic design background. Um, I was going to go for my MBA, and all of a sudden I just I just felt like I I lost interest in that. I, I knew that um, God was calling me to, to share His truth, but of course I was like, well, I need to. I, I've been s under such bad teaching. Um, I really need to go to seminary and 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 really have a, a proper understanding, and that's what led me into seminary. Because I remember I, I went back and looked at it. I started looking at seminaries three days after I was saved, mm -hmm. um, and because and 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 things changed. My priorities completely changed, and I had this uh, that assurance of salvation to realize that like I'm not boasting in myself. I'm bo it's it's what Christ did on the cross, and, and I'm focusing on that. And just to have that freedom, now I'm able to minister to others. So when I was living the whole time in the Orthodox Church, I was just trying to figure out, I, I need to figure out what I need to do with, uh, um, with God on Judgment Day. I need to make sure I'm okay. You're not. It's really hard to think about others, which I think makes a lot of sense why it's not common within Orthodoxy to find a lot of evangelism. There, there are some cases, but it's, it's not a big thing. Even the trend of right now, so many people going into the Orthodox Church, they'll even say, well, we really didn't do anything different. It's just people who started researching about the church. And I would say not really knowing what they're getting themselves into, getting into the church. Um, but they're not very big on evangelism because if you look at their process, it's so self-focused. Um, even if you look at um, what I would say is the chief end of man is to glorify God. Hmm. But for them, they would say the chief end of man is theosis. It, the process of becoming a God is what they would say. Um, so it's really focused on self. You're, you're, you're focused on self so much, you're not really... Um, able to focus on others as well. Interesting. Yeah. So they get that from what is it, Saint Athanasius, who says, "It's you know, I'm paraphrasing, but what is it? The goal of the incarnation was so that men could become God." Correct. Yeah. God became uh, a man. man so that man can become God. Yeah. That's you know that sounds really weird, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> and, and, when you really, and when you really look at it and really study it too. Um, and you realize what it entails, because in order to go through this process of theosis, you got to do all the sacraments and everything, and um, you you need like Mary's help throughout the whole thing. I mean, their views on Mary is um, it, it is it is eye opening. I mean, and that's one of the things that when when people are considering the Orthodox Church, read about what they say about Mary. The things that they say about her, they they basically um, attribute to her almost everything that should be attributed to Christ. Hmm. They're attributing to her, and it's. It's quite problematic. What was that message that you heard in that Assemblies of God church? Or was it just a couple of sermons and messages? Like, uh, you know, was it an immediate conviction or realization? Like, this is what I must do is repent and put my trust in Christ? Yeah, I was definitely hearing, hearing multiple messages. But the, even the first time when I heard the message, it was just seeing how the word of God was used. So, you know, when you walk into a typical Orthodox church and you hear their homily, uh, it, it's not very long, usually, um, sometimes 15 minutes, sometimes shorter. Uh, I just recently saw something about the Pope. I know he's Catholic, but mentioning about, hey, priest, don't don't have your homilies more than eight minutes. Yeah, I saw that too. <laughs> yeah, uh, which I know orthodoxy is different because I know any, any ortho bros watching right now are going to be like, we're not Catholic. I know, we know that. <laughs> but um, but when you walk into an orthodox church and you hear the, the homilies, they're usually short. Um, sometimes they're about the, the scripture that's read. Oftentimes it's about saints. Um, or, or different stories or different uh, practices that they do in explaining it. So you're, you're, you're very malnourished. You know, you, uh, you'll have certain people like, like my dad. My dad served as a diacon in, in, the, in the Orthodox Church or a deacon mm. in the Orthodox Church. 
Um, and he spent 70 some odd years in the church. And I just told him, so what's Galatians about? And he couldn't tell me. Oh, uh, so, and, and I'm like, and, and again, this is not, this was not against him, but this is just anyone who was in the church. A lot of people just, they didn't, they were biblically illiterate. And, and oftentimes you read Orthodox books written by Eastern Orthodox writers explain that this is a problem. You know, mm. that, that, that they, they tend to be more biblically illiterate, that yes, Protestants do have a, a better um, grasp of, of scripture um, and they focus on it a lot more. So that was the big, the, the huge thing that I saw different uh, as a difference there was the handling of God's word and trusting and realizing, whoa, um, you know, you, you don't need all these traditions or everything. It's, it's, it's all of it. All, all you need to know is in God's word. So it sounds like the majority of those who go to those churches, they're, they don't read the Bibles ever, right? Because it's just to focus more on tradition and what you got to do to become a god. And yeah, well, you have so much. You have so much distractions. Uh, and there are some people. There are some people who read their, their 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 Bible and they have good habits. But you have so many distractions. Your 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 um the saints play such a huge factor um into your life. Um, I remember I would be in in college and I would have um different saints that I would um have for each course that I took to be praying for me for that course. Mm. And you would get so familiar with the saint stories. Um, I used to um write homilies and stuff for the local priest that I would go to about the different saint stories. And he would sometimes share it in service or just share it when he's meeting with different people in the congregation because the saint stories were, um, were, were so critical. Um, and even as a part of their liturgy, they have um, different saints about the, you know, and on their day, they'll, they'll read the different stories about the saints and people are so infatuated by that. And it's really um, a lot of it is like um, a prosperity gospel. You know, you would pray to these saints oftentimes for material possessions. That's oftentimes what people were praying for. And it was basically just another, um, you know, view of like a prosperity gospel. What uh, What is the canon that the, that the Coptics have? Is it the same as the, the, the Eastern Orthodox? Like I know they, it's not closed canon. It's like a formal canon, as they say. Yeah, they they have they have di- yeah they have a di- different canons than what the Eastern Orthodox believe. Okay, uh, what is it? Uh, the is it is it the Apocrypha? Like that's included in it? Oh, so, um, uh, I'm trying to think of how many. Um, I am not to sure. <laughs> how, yeah, to be honest, I'm thinking back now. I know that the East so the Eastern Orthodox has a different uh, list of canons than the, than the Roman Catholics. Oh, um, like you okay. can get in, in the Easter, uh, there's a study Bible, the Eastern Orthodox study Bible. I believe the Orientals have just a few books different, but uh, I'm not 100 percent sure. I'm trying to think. When I was in the Oriental and they came out with the 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 Eastern Orthodox study Bible, I believe they're like, oh yeah, it's basically most of the books we have. They may have had a book or two different, but I'll say this: that was me in the Coptic Church, in the Eastern, uh, sorry, in the uh, Ethiopian Orthodox Church, which was Oriental. They have a completely different set of uh, Bibles um, that mm. they have. They have a, a like a. I think they have one of the largest lists of Bible uh, books that they accept in their canon. Is so, is the EB, uh, is the Ethiopian and Coptic the same church and just different? No, regions? they're di- they're different churches. So they're different churches, but they're both Oriental. Okay, and but do, okay, so those churches are they in communion with one another? They are. Yep. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. How did that happen? How did that split happen? So, so all, all the Orientals are technically in communion with each other, and mm-hmm. same thing with the um, the Eastern Orthodox. But sometimes you'll have certain parishes that have different requirements. Like I remember my brother, um, uh, he went to an Eastern Orthodox church that was it wasn't Greek. It was a, a, I forget exactly which one it was. Yeah. But they wouldn't they wouldn't allow um, the person to have communion unless um, I think they had to have like weekly confession. So they would have different rules and stuff. So sometimes. It's up to the parish. Sometimes um, they'll only let certain people. They have different. They have different rules. But um, yeah, all Eastern Orthodox churches are technically in communion with each other, and they would all be considered the true church. And all Orientals in their group, they would consider each person. So the Coptics and the e- um, Ethiopian Orthodox Church, Got it. Okay. although they're different, they would consider themselves um, uh, still within the same church. Okay, gotcha. What would you say to these young people who are being persuaded by the history now and then and then converting? Like, how would you address this problem that's going on? Or have you come across somebody in person in your church that were asking these questions? Yeah, I've come across a lot of different people. First of all, study history and and don't study history by just looking at like you know a day dyer video with some <laughs> orthodox. 
um, a book that's written about it. Like study people from both sides. And I, I that's why I encourage people um, read Eastern Orthodox books, but also read books written by other people too and compare because when you actually study like um, real church history, you realize like, especially with like with icons, um, there is just no way that you can justify the fact that um, icon veneration was happening in the early church. Um, there, there's just no way you can find that. Is, um, it, is, is that because like, it's just missing or is that because they outright spoke against kind of practices along those lines? Oh, they outright spoke out against it. The, the early fathers were speaking against it. You had certain people who were tearing down different images and, and telling people don't do this. They were specifically saying we as Christians don't do this, but the pagans do this. I mean, they were, they were staunchly against it. Um, and you only start seeing a trend starting to change later on. And really when you want to see, where things go really haywire. Um, so you look at Constantine. Uh, when he had his Edict of Milan and he made Christianity legal, um, it didn't just make it legal. It also made it popular because mm -hmm. it was really popular to be whatever um, religion the emperor was. So what you ended up having was an influx of nominal Christianity. Um, and then Emperor Theodosius came along a little bit later on, and he had his Edict of, um, I think, Thessalonica, and he made Christianity mandatory. Hmm. Where now you didn't have it. Now, if you wanted to be part of the empire, you had to be a Christian. Hmm. So now, now you're having tons of people who are becoming Christian and they don't really want to be, but they, they, they want to still stay in the empire. So that's when you start seeing practices like the icons becoming uh, more problematic, problematic because they used to have idols and they're like, well, we don't have idols anymore, but now we have icons. Oh, we used to have goddesses, but now we have Mary and we're going to treat her in a way that's completely inappropriate to how scripture had said. Um, to, to honor her and instead treat her as if she's a goddess. Um, so you see a lot of those problematic things happening when um, Christianity became, um, instead of being the persecuted religion, becoming the mainstream, you know, government sponsored religion, then all these problems happen. Because wh what do you expect? Can you imagine if, if we were by force in America, it came out, you all have to be Christian now. And oh, yeah, it, it, it's going to be problematic. So if you just study that history and really focus on that, and you're like, wow, all these things that they claim are apostolic traditions, you can actually pinpoint where in history you start seeing this evolution happening. And that's why you don't start hearing more about people uh, talking about venerating icons until after that time, the, the post-Constantine, post-Emperor Theodosius time. Well, people don't realize that, and that's an important uh, shift in history of the church. Yeah. Yeah. There was you know, pre-Constantine and post-Constantine, and that's where this magisterial political aspect came onto this. And so there, there was a difference because what's often thrown out there is like, oh, look, they said the Holy Apostle Catholic Church or the One Holy uh, Apostolic Church. And see, you know, that's, you know, that's us. But that was a different church than pre -con than, than what happened post-Constantine. Correct. Yeah. And it's a historical to say that Irenaeus, went, you know, when he wrote and spoke about apostolic uh, succession, that he meant this magisterium in this political yeah. form and it goes right under the radar, right under the nose. And you don't actually, you know, unless you know your history, like you said, like, study, you know, actually study these things, yeah. you know, you're going to think, oh, maybe they do have a point, but actually, no, they don't. And they're, yeah. they're the ones that are being a historical on this. Correct. And that's why defining terms and actually paying attention to the authorial intent of the person writing what they're saying is so critical in understanding this. And that's why if you're, and, and again, you'll see this a lot of times by people in the Orthodox community to be like, oh, you guys just like to cherry pick, but they're notorious for cherry picking the different early fathers oh and getting things right. out of context. Yeah, uh, you know, saying something that was early on in church history and trying to apply it to, to, to current times, it didn't mean the same thing then. And, and those things are important for us to study. Yeah, definitely. How would you then answer though, because you know, you're talking about as well as the scriptures, how would you answer too when they ask you, well, you know, how do you know what, what the scriptures are without us? <laughs> I know, you know, it's, it, it's a good answer. And I'm really trying to equip people to be able to answer that because, you know, that's one of the most common objections. And again, I think these are, these are causing young, young people to, to shift and like think like, oh, you know, maybe I should leave and become EO and Roman Catholic, maybe. Well, because it, it sounds like a convincing argument. And, and the reason it sounds like a convincing argument, because it's, it's what the Pharisees really use. It's, it's, it's an argument the Pharisees would use. They would say, um, you need to believe in us because we carry the oral traditions from Moses. So these are, and, and Moses got them from God. So you have to listen to us. And they applied all these man-made traditions that they added um, in addition to what the Old Testament commands were. 
But what did Jesus say to that? I mean, we look at Mark 7, we realize that Jesus gave us the grounds for how we should have our hermeneutics. And it should be grounded in the word of God and not in the traditions of man. Meaning that if it's if it's not grounded in the word of God, then it, it, it shouldn't be something that we're uh, applying in, into our lives. Um, and really when we study scripture and we come together as brothers and sisters in Christ uh, and we hold each other accountable and, and we're studying it by looking at the actual words in the Greek and the Hebrew or Aramaic and, and coming together and fellowshipping. And, and that's how we know what the truth of what it says in God's word, not from these people who are claiming an authority and then they have no real proof to back it up because the, the the Eastern Orthodox um, or the Oriental Orthodox, what they'll come and do is say, look, we got our traditions from the apostles and it's never changed. It was oral and we have no proof of it. Hmm. It's the exact same thing that the Pharisees said, but we saw from Jesus, he kept saying over and over and over again, but it is written this, it is written this, it is written this. And we know too that scripture promises that if, if we're truly genuine to surrender to him, that we will have the Holy Spirit living in us and the Holy Spirit will guide us and help us. And that is why we can have people from all different backgrounds all around the world come together and still fellowship on those core things. Why, why you and I can see, see each other as brothers in Christ. Um, even though we may have different backgrounds and everything, yeah. because we are being led by the yeah. Holy spirit and we're, and we're trusting in what God's word says. But for, for a lot of people, they don't want that. They want somebody to tell them what to do. They want somebody to do that. And um, if you were in the first century, the Pharisees would have made you very happy. They would tell you all these different things you could have done, but Jesus said, that's not the way. You, you actually have to wrestle with the text. You actually have to read it. You, you, that's how you pursue him. You're, you're reading it. You're surrendering to it. And if your heart is true that you're surrendering, he's going to reveal to you the truth over time. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, when you became a Christian then, like, was it discovering like things like justification by faith for the first time? Or did you ever hear of those terms before? I've, I've heard it a little bit. Um, I, I knew, uh, I, like, I knew the history a little bit about, about Martin Luther, but I, I was just like, oh, you know, um, cause the way they would talk about it, oh, it's the Protestants. They just have a really simple view of things, but we have like, you know, we have the fullness of the faith. We we're the true church. So I discounted it, um, so quickly, uh, never seriously considered it. But once I saw what the text was saying, what scripture said, and that, that's what was most powerful, you know, um, even as a, as a reformed Baptist, um, I, I'm not very good at quoting, um, Calvin or anyone else, but, but when it comes to what scripture says, that's the reason why I believe what I believe is because of what scripture says. Um, and so just seeing the, the, the power in scripture and seeing what all, all of it that, that it says, um, I believe in the Eastern Orthodox Church, when you go through the liturgy, even though they're reading from the Bible, they'll cover the gospels, but they're not necessarily going through every single book and they're definitely not expounding it and explaining it. Um, so there's, there's power in his word. Yeah, so now like you're all about the word, it seems like absolutely as, mentioned, as it should be. Yeah, and 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 that's why for me, I spend probably fifteen to twenty hours a week um, um, to exposit a text in scripture, and and you realize you, you really need to look at you know, the languages, the historical context, uh, seeing the, the passage in context. Um, you'll often hear a lot of times when um, people in orthodoxy are using scripture they are just taking it way out of context. They're not considering the context and they're not used to expositional preaching at all um, mm. within, within orthodoxy. So um, you start to have, um, you can see how you, 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 since you don't have a great handling of the word of God, you can be swayed in any direction based on whatever the church says. And ultimately it's just, well, if the church says it, it doesn't even have to make sense. We're just going to follow it. Yeah. And that's why, you know, when you engage in these debates and talks, there's not a lot of talk about exegesis. No, there isn't. It's always the quote, uh, you know, the, the quote, mind church fathers, yeah. this, this bishop, this priest, read this book, listen to this podcast, debate this guy. Mm -hmm. And if you stick with the scriptures, like don't, you know, we don't have to give up that ground. Yeah. Uh, you know, make them deal with the text for, you know, force them into exegesis because, and that's more powerful than not. And end of the day, they can't deny it. Like, you know, their claim is not, well, Genesis through Revelation is is not the scripture. I don't know the Coptics uh, if they hold to like books like Revelation or our scripture, but Eastern. Oh Orthodox, yeah, they do. Yeah. They do. Yeah. Okay, good. So you know, even you know, you know, stuff like that. Like you know, we can really still you know apply the same uh, methods and standards, which is God's word, which is supreme, because everybody has to submit to it. Yeah. You can't contradict God's word. It, it's just not. It's just not happening. No matter what you claim, no matter how good you think you are, and how great you know you know you try to prop up your church to say that it's infallible 
See, and that was the thing. You were in the Orthodox Church, and they would um, they would kiss the Bible all the time. They would they would um, at least in the, in, the, in the Coptic Church, they would say never put a book on top of the Bible. You know, you want to show a reverence, but they didn't really use it. And that was the problem. You know, you had the Pharisees. The Pharisees, they, they could quote scripture better better than most of us now could, but they didn't really understand it. Hmm. Um, and that's the problem. And yeah, you oftentimes hear Orthodox apologists speaking, you know, they hold their books out with all their bookmarks in it that they have and, you know, quote all these different church fathers and say, well, the church said this and the church said that. But what about what, what, what does the text say? And what does the text say in context? And let's wrestle with the text. And what do you do when, when, when the text confronts, uh, you know, is in conflict with church tradition, well, they're always going to choose church tradition over what the Bible says. Yeah. And that's the problem. You mentioned, you know, a couple of times too, which, you know, seems to be something that, that stood out to you during your time was the icon veneration. So is that like a, like one of the biggest problems that is, is most prevalent? This is kind of this pagan philosophy that's into, you know what you know what it means to venerate and you know how they say it's not worship but it's venerating and then praying to saints and maybe you know even the mariology that comes into this oh yeah they, they will try to make the distinction that there's uh there's a distinction we don't we don't worship we just venerate but if you look at their actions um it, it's exactly the same thing as worship so um although they say that that that's not what they do and the problem is being in it for 32 years like i i'm not somebody who just converted in i've been orthodox for a few years i've been in it for 32 years i saw people obsess over saints they knew more about the saints than they knew about jesus they would read about saint stories all the time and barely touch their bible and guess what i was one of those people mm. there was a certain patriarch in the coptic church um and that i i just loved him so much that i would read all his books but i i, I would barely touch my bible in comparison and you see that happening to a lot of people they, they get they go to these icons they they kiss it they they do all these things and it's the exact same thing as worship and and, and you ask well, what's it, what's the difference then you know you look in revelation when john bowed down to the angel um he was told don't do that yet they have icons of angels that they bow down to and do the exact same thing that John was told not to do. Hmm. Um, so there's really no way to distinguish it. So although they say, oh, it's veneration, it's not worship, um, they're, they're, they're written, their actions are actually saying that they worship them. Would you pray to Mary too? At the, and, and Mary was the biggest one. Um, Mary yeah. was, was the go-to because they would say, well, it's, it's Jesus' mother, so you go to her. And the way that the Eastern Orthodox especially presents her um, is that she's extremely compassionate compared to Jesus. You know, if you go to Jesus, um, he may reject you. But if you go to Mary, she's so much more compassionate. And she'll go to Jesus and kind of be like, hey, come on, for my sake, do it. Um, and they'll have these different little, little prayers that they'll do. And it, it will show this narrative, this back and forth between the sinner um, praying to Mary and Mary continue going to Jesus and Jesus being like, nope, I'm not going to forgive him. Going back, well, he won't forgive you. Oh, please, Mother Mary, you know, do this, do this. Uh, okay, let me go back to my son. And eventually he's like, well, he doesn't deserve it, but for your sake, I'll do it. Hmm. So, you know, when you when you read stuff like this, you realize, well, I need to go to Mary all the time. And, and they really look at her as essential for salvation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, any any final words that you know uh, you want to leave us with, and you know maybe you know a message to to people who are struggling with this, you know whether they're in it, thinking about going in it. Yeah, definitely um, do a lot of research. Um, do do a lot of reading. Don't read one side. Re read both sides. Um, it, it's really good when when you're talking with other people. Like um, if you're going to speak to an Eastern Orthodox person, you don't just want to be like, oh, well, you guys are just Catholics, basically. I understand what people are saying when they say that because yeah. there's similarities. But once you say to an Eastern Orthodox person, you're just Catholic, they're going to say, well, you, you really um, don't know anything about us. Like read Eastern Orthodox books, read books written by the reformers, read different, read different books, um, read critical books against Eastern Orthodoxy. Those are really good. Joshua Shuping has a great book, Disillusioned, because he was attracted to the church and then left it um, and even became an Orthodox priest um, in the process and then left it. But what's really good about him is he explains what are the attractions to the church. Like here are the attractions, but here are the things that you really don't know getting into it that you kind of find out once you're in it. And at that point, you're just like, wow, I, I didn't realize what I was getting myself into. A lot of these false promises, the, the sales pitch that they gave me isn't as good as it really is. So I would say do a lot of research and um, don't just follow some YouTubers and, and everything. No, 
actually get into get into some reading, read some serious uh, church history books, and read on different sides and compare, and ultimately pray, pray, and make sure that whatever you're following does not contradict what Scripture says. You got to follow what Scripture says because if you're going to sacrifice what Scripture says to follow what other people are saying, um, that's a, that's a real bad sign. Well, uh, you know, uh, you mentioned about how um, I think you mentioned something along the lines of the church being appealing to people and like the, you know, the Orthodoxy church, because nowadays there's, there's such a problem with, with these churches in America, as we know, where everything's a sensationalized and emotionalism and there are, there are no aesthetics. And so when you go into this church like that, it seems like, wow, you know, this is what I'm looking for. You know, everybody's waking up, but they're, they're realizing that wokeism is, is wrong. It's stupid. It doesn't work. Traditional values and marriage family. That's the, that is the way to go. You know, the American way, you know, uh, that, uh, that is the way to go. And then you go into these churches where it's like, wait a minute, you guys are just like CNN. You're preaching the same kind of doctrines yeah. and you go to these other churches, Eastern Orthodoxy, Roman Catholicism It's like, oh, this is tradition. This is what I'm looking for. They're, this is beauty. Church is sacred. And, th- you know, this is where, you know, we as Protestants have to be more Protestant and realize, yeah, we got church or not we, but um, these other churches get church wrong. Mm-hmm. And this is not true Christianity. This is not true Protestantism, but that's also not true Christianity. That's also not true, true, uh, you know, biblical scriptural Christianity. Yeah. Well, and, and that's the thing. People get so attracted by the aesthetics and everything. Um, but really it's, it's, it's not as ancient as it appears when you actually realize that a lot of the practices, um, even even when the, the empire started, because because the, the the people who built all the big basilicas was Constantine and different emperors. They are the ones who started building the, the big um, the cathedrals. They're the ones who um, started to make it where they, they would um, they would be the ones who would um, appoint the bishops. And a lot of times that became very political or who had money, um, and that's the reason why the patriarchs in the Orthodox Church have a crown because it's to represent that you represented the emperor. So what you're seeing there is the product of a state-run church, and it's not as ancient as it was because it, when you really look at scripture and you look at what like the synagogue looked like, it was much more simple um, in comparison to this ornate um, building that you walk into that has a sense of holiness, but really is not as ancient as it appears. And it really kind of follows that same strategy of th- that appeal that you have with like some of these churches that try to make themselves like a concert and they have the, their fog machines and everything. Well, you're trading in those fog machines for, for incense and you're trading in the, that rock concert experience for these hymns that sound really old. So you're, what you're really seeing is some people are just trading one experience for just another experience, but mm. they're, they're losing the substance of, of it all, uh, which is a true gospel message. And what we need to do is focus on what, what scripture says and, 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 and yes, have reverence for, for when we gather together um, and, and understand. I know in uh, R.C. Sproul's book, The Holiness of God, he talks about that, that sometimes the, the way that we carry ourselves in church, it always makes it feel like we don't have reverence for God. Um, so that is important that we have that, but we don't want to go to something that's just manufactured um, just to appeal to our emotions that is not truly holy when mm-hmm. you really look at it, because it may look holy, but it's just a veneer on the inside. It's rotten to the core. Amen. Yeah. Uh, well put when you said they're training one experience in for another. You know, we have to fall in love with God, not a denomination, not not aesthetics. Not that these things don't matter because they do, because yeah. I do think church should be sacred. And again, yeah. we should get rid of this, you know, this sensational, emotional, dark lit atmosphere that, you know, that's wrong. So I'm not saying, you know, these things don't matter. But I'm saying is, is it, it, it starts somewhere and, and beauty is from God. So I mean, you know, we go to God first and everything else will flow. We're not going to trade in one experience one bad experience for another bad experience or one false exactly. experience for another false experience. Can, yeah. uh, can they follow you anywhere? Uh, you know, pastor Samuel on, on maybe any podcast yeah, expo- or Twitter. Yeah. Exposing the word ministries. It's on, um, you know, Facebook, uh, YouTube, uh, Instagram, Twitter. Um, anyone can reach out to me if I can help in any way. Uh, I'm always glad to help out in any way. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. You know, I really appreciate you and My coming pleasure. on t- and even talking about, about your testimony. My pleasure. And to the viewers, if you could please like this video, share, and don't forget to subscribe. And thanks for tuning in. Until next time, we'll see you. Take care and God bless.